So uh, welcoming Steve back for, I think this is the final um, final commentary on the EcoAg uh, perspective, this time on the topic of energetics. And we've welcomed as well, uh, Dolph Zantinga from Europe to uh, share uh, much insight that he's he's garnered over his decades. So uh, today we've got a special a special uh, a twofer. Steve will do about about thirty minutes, um, and then and then Dolph will do about thirty minutes, and then we'll go to question and answer. So I uh, won't waste anyone's time with my words. I'll uh, we'll just jump into it. Go for it, Steve. Okay, let me see if I can. What do we do? I forget how you do the. Uh... Uh, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. All right, everybody. Okay. So, right. So we've, we're talking about the three pillars of eco agriculture, uh, because it's been so, so important in, uh, alternative farming systems and in food quality has a big influence on nutrient dense food quality. Uh, we've talked about the three pillars being the minerals, biology, and energy. So this one is going to be on energy and bioenergetics. So let's see. So let's go back uh, just the first few slides since some people are only coming into this lecture and have missed the previous ones. Let me just go back over this very quickly. So uh, the Acres USA experience comes out of Charles Walters, who was an ag journalist and actually started it in June of, of 50 years ago. So 1971. And so this is the 50 year anniversary for the magazine and then the 45 years of the trade show and conference with along with the seminars. And we talked about how the real common feature of eco agriculture has been three day and four day seminars. Early on, Charles really emphasized economic and ecological that uh, eco agriculture, eco farming, they were, these were very popular terms back in the 1970s. And then the other thing is that this experience has been very influential. It, it uh, influenced Amigo Bob Contisano with the Eco Farm Conference at Asilomar, and then Dan Kittredge with the Bionutrient Food Association, and also Advancing Eco Agriculture, which is John Kemp's company that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, so this experience has continued to grow and, and expand out. Uh, the other thing that we talk about is how it's standing on the shoulders of giants, and there's been a series of pioneers and teachers who have been part of this experience, and uh, so, yeah, quite a few of those. And then, uh, for example, Kerry Reams, you know, he talked about energy. He talked about how Einstein talked about breaking apart the atom, and you know, Kerry Reams was talking about using energy to create matter and create a healthy living system. But you have a number of people in there, Arden Anderson, Bruce Tanio, uh, Dan Scow, Phil Wheeler, David Yarrow, uh, Glenn Rabenberg, uh, uh, Hugh Lovell, and, and onwards. A lot of these people include energy and bioenergetics in their teaching and consultancy. So, and then I should mention that the Bionutrient Food Association has featured some real top-notch physicists and biophysicists. Uh, for example, Dean Radin, Beverly Rubick, James Oshman, and those lecturers are available on YouTube. So, and then um, an important thing to note is that organic versus conventional is what I call a false dichotomy. And so there's been a series of alternative farming systems that have come out of the, this whole experience of people trying to find ways to raise local healthy foods and to raise healthy crops with non-toxic pest control and to boost the the health and nutrition and energy of these crops so they don't require as many pesticide sprays using things like designing agro ecosystems that mimic nature, taking advantage of things like biodiversity, uh, minimal disturbance of the soil, mulches, intercropping, with a big emphasis on organic and biological soil amendments and all of that leading to a healthy consortia of beneficial microorganisms. So, uh, a number of these include sustainable agriculture, organic farming, permaculture, and then nature farming in Japan, uh, nature farming in Korea, nature farming in India, and then mob grazing and holistic grazing, 
in biodynamic agriculture. And then finally, what we're coming down to to talk to today is eco agriculture and the experience there. So then, uh, so the three pillars, we've been through minerals uh, and nutrient density. We've been through biology and humus management. And today we're talking about energy and bioenergetics. So that includes everything from growing healthy crops so they have good photosynthesis and uh, the BRICS level for you know, using a refractometer to measure BRICS and how BRICS is it's an indicator of soluble salts, but also organic acids and minerals, the electrical conductivity meter, and then really jumping into bioenergy. So that includes things like the biofield, electromagnetic magnetic and scalar energy, and paramagnetic and subtle energies. So the other thing I want to mention is that if, you know, we're talking about alternative farming systems, they certainly have uh, and do lend different concepts and methods, but there's more to this. And so what I want to mention here are some of the features that have grown out of the sustainable agriculture experience is that, you know, when I took my first year of college, I took horticulture. They talked about it being the art and science of horticulture. And so, you know, we, we you know, our society placed a lot of in emphasis on, on Western science. You know, we had the whole land grant college experience, but in the whole alternative farming system, sustainable agriculture, we place a real emphasis on practitioner or farmer knowledge. And then kind of breaking out of the hierarchical flow of, of information and, and decision-making to more horizontal. So it's not a top-down approach. It's more where uh, it's a level playing field and the stakeholders, farmers, uh, are an important part of that decision-making process. These alternative farming systems are real unique and innovative. So if you think about the bell-shaped curve, it, you, a lot of these people, are the pioneers and teachers are, and farmer practitioners are the innovators, innovators and early adopters on a bell-shaped curve. There's been a, a real emphasis on women in agriculture and ethnic diversity and indigenous knowledge systems that have really elevated and empowered people all across the, the planet. And uh, so that's been a huge emphasis um, and it's made a really big shift in the ag college experience as well. So I'd say that it's, it's not, especially eco-agriculture is not locked in to a set or prescribed standards, but it's really like what works. I mean, how, what, what can we find that works? And, it, and it's true in regenerative agriculture today. And then finally, we talk about alternative farming systems. And so that's under a large category called alternative agriculture. There's been a big emphasis on alternative crops and livestock. And generally, even the tobacco settlement, um, they're, they're trying to provide alternative crops to tobacco farmers. Uh, there's a big emphasis on the alternative farming systems. And then finally, what's, it, what's relevant for today is that it, the, the other side of alternative agriculture really is alternative. It embraces free energy, subtle energy, bioenergetics, and holistic health and a lot of different modalities that are used in holistic health and holistic agriculture. Some really key databases of alternative energy and agriculture in the biofield, one that not very many people know about, but there's a guy named Stephen Ross in Sedona, Arizona. He's managed the World Research Foundation Library for decades, and it's a really amazing source on holistic health and energy medicine. He's got over I think 15,000 volumes in the library. He has uh, rare books and documents going back to the 14th and 15th century. Uh, so the ATRA Resource Center, which is the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, part of NCAT, the National Center for Public Technology, their resource center, another really incredible resource on alternative agriculture, sustainable agriculture, well over 10,000 volumes in that, in that resource center. Rexresearch.com, that's, that's a huge online database source of all kinds of things relating to dowsing, radionics, homeopathy, electromagnoculture, etc. There's another website that's a digital collection of thousands of old magazines and periodicals, and this is the International Association for the Preservation of Spiritual and Occult 
periodicals. But for example, there's old uh, periodicals in there that have original articles by Lily Kalisko in the work she did in biodynamics and homeopathy. Now, the other one is ICEAM, which is the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energies in Energy Medicine. It's really important because they have an annual symposium and they publish the Subtle Energy and Energy Medicine Journal, which has been real instrumental since the late 1980s. Then the Journal of Borderland Research uh, is a really key archive. Also the Journal of Scientific Exploration. And then a new initiative is the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. They have a database of nearly 300 biofield devices and technologies. So that would be helpful. The other thing is that in, there, there's some key journals in alternative agriculture, biophysics, and energy medicine. I'll just mention a few. So the American Journal of Alternative Agriculture that came out of the experience of um, the USDA report on organic agriculture, 1980. So that's been a key journal. Uh, also on an international uh, uh, scale, agriculture, ecosystems, and the environment and biological agriculture and horticulture, those based in Europe. You have, you have other journals like Journal of Biological Physics, Electromagnetic and Biology and Energy, I'm sorry, Electromagnetic Biology and Medicine. You have Water, a multidisciplinary research journal. And then a few more obscure ones, Global Journal of Science Frontiers Research. And and an interesting thing is that the CIA archives are actually a great source of alternative uh, thinking, uh, science, medicine, the Chinese Journal of Somatic Science. That's, that's one where they, you can read all about how the Chinese experience has gotten into Qigong and remote healing and various kinds of healing uh, modalities, and then the Stargate Project, and then also some several journals on homeopathy. So let's, let's go back and look. The 1970s were a real, uh, really key time in the United States. There was a lot was going on. And 1973 is when Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird came out with The Secret Life of Plants. And I'm telling you, it had a huge impact on my generation. Um, it got into a lot of interesting things about plants and, and energy. Uh, the ESPN plants, uh, extrasensory perception, Marcel Vogel crystals, Jagadish Chandra Bose, Goethe, the Lahosky coils, Carolian photography and auras, various things on radionics and biodynamics. And, and then in the, the same time period, they were, the, this featured Cleve Baxter. He was, uh, he was an expert in galvanic response or lie detectors. And he's the guy who hooked up plants to lie detectors and, and did biofeedback and found out that they have extrasensory perception. And that led to concepts in life, for, life force energy and biofield. And then by extension, the concept of quantum non-locality non and also how this information can travel much faster than the speed of light. And so a number of people have followed up on that research and they've done cell cultures and people have been able to influence cell cultures and plants from miles away from different continents instantaneously. So that was all very interesting. And then, so let's go back also, let's go to an early pioneer. Harold Saxton Burr was a premier anatomy professor at the Yale University School of Medicine. And in the 1930s, he came up with the electrodynamic theory of how there's bioelectricity and electrophysiology, and he measured those in middle this concept known as L fields or fields of life. And essentially what he's saying and what he found out was that these bioelectrical gradients serve as blueprints that guide morphogenesis. And so he, you know, then he also did things like he was able to develop techniques for early detection of cancer. He looked at things like hybrid vigor and sweet corn, and he could tell the difference in hybrid vigor by its electro bioelectricity. Okay. All right, let's just go on to the next one. This one. Uh, so another pioneer was a. Uh, 
inventor of electroculture and antennas and devices in 1920s France, Justin Christophe Flew. So this was interesting. So he did, had these devices, you can see them there. He had various wires and things that he would just say that we're going to pull down electricity from the atmosphere, put it in the soil and promote plant growth. And so they, <laughs> this, uh, this has gone on in the 1920s. It kind of fell out and then it's come back around, but they were, this was real popular growing large vegetables. That's a cabbage that he was, he was raising. He also raised oats there and there was no fert fertilizer applied to that field. And he did a really good job of uh, raising plants that way. So uh, in the modern times, people have taken this up. So if you look up electromagniculture or Yannick Van Dorn on Facebook, there's a whole lot of practitioners exploring this now. So they've got electrical coils, they've got copper coils, they have various cones, and they have antennas, and also pyramids are very important, uh, really popular with that group, and also raising large vegetables, the same thing as Justin Christo flew. So uh, let's see. Okay, so in the Acres USA experience, so uh, we have a number of people there who've all explored energy. That's why it's part of the one of the three pyramids. So um, in one of the three pillars. So Carrie Reams, we talked about Carrie Reams before, how he talked about the biological theory of ionization or RBTI. Aaron, Re Aaron Fried Pfeiffer was really a popular author in the early years of Acres USA and what he's done with biodynamic preparations. And then Galen Hieronymus, he did a lot with radionics, cosmoculture, and copper wires. He actually did the copper wire where he had a dark basement and grew plants by having a copper wire that went outside to the sunshine. Phil Callahan is pretty well known for his work in paramagnetism. And then uh, that's led into Towers of Power. Hugh Level, we've talked about before, real instrumental in quantum agriculture, has a book out on it taught at many conferences, had field broadcasters, which were a modernized version of the cosmic pipes from Hieronymus, and taught radionics and dowsing. Arden Anderson, uh, he, he did a lot with Reams RBTI, also taught a lot of workshops on radionics all around the world, and would often refer to Robert Becker on who did the body electric, and then Fritz Albert Pop, who did biophotons. Phil Wheeler was another consultant, taught four-day workshops on radionics and, and also offered the Vega sound machine. And then, and then these other guys like Albert Roy Davis and Walter C. Rawls, they were really big on magnets and biomagnetism and a lot has been published on that. So at the Acres USA trade show, you'll see homeopathy, agrohomeopathy, Lahosky, multi-wave oscillator, structured water, various free energy devices, Vega bioresonance machines, and, and, and so forth. So uh, just with a few more slides left, I'll just make just an example. So we're talking about energy and, you know, this comes up and farmers, some people are real interested in this and that a lot of people push back, academics push back on that. And it's, you know, say it's not practical, but Let's just look at a couple examples from the biodynamic experience. So, you know, you have the agriculture course from Rudolf Steiner, and then he talked about the biodynamic field sprays with horn manure and horn silica and the biodynamic compost preparations. But look at one of the early research pioneers of biodynamics was Lily Kalisco, and she's written several books, did an amazing amount of research because really it goes back to what works is that you know Steiner gave these lectures and he suggested that there are subtle energies at play that we can understand and use in agriculture to benefit our crops and livestock and promote our health and so she did a lot of research and this is one of the examples she did with capillary dynamolysis uh, or the rising um, rising you know capillary method and so this was a Sun-Saturn conjunct in 1926. And this is what the capillary dynamolysis looks before and after the conjunct. And then during the conjunct, it was blocked. So the chromatogram shows that and it proves that planetary forces, planetary cosmic forces interact with metals in solution on Earth. The other thing she did, she did a lot with early the very earliest research on agrohomeopathy, and she would do dilutions with um, 
different substances and then germinate wheat seeds, for example. And she showed this, what is known as the Kalisco curve. So you can see that at 17, 18 uh, X dilutions, it's one thing, but then when you jump to 19 and 20, it, it goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up. So she, she did thousands and thousands of these research experiments to show all this. And then, um, so, and then in modern times, some of the things that have come out of the biodynamic experience and out of the eco ag experience and the alternative ag experience have, have made its way into mainstream science. And so forth, this was an example of some research in 2011. This was uh, using capillary dynamolysis. They would do image discrimination. They looked at conventional tomatoes and organic tomatoes, and they ran the chromatograms and did the digital image analysis. And the conclusion is, is that the capillary rising picture method is 100% accurate for discriminating between organic and conventional tables, tomatoes, whether fresh or frozen. And then I think finally, I'm gonna talk quickly about Glenn Atkinson. He's one of the premier agrohomeopathy researchers. He's in New Zealand. He's, he was a Kiwi grower, he's retired now, but he does have these various homeopathic sprays. And so in this instance, he's showing that you can take broad, broad bean and based on the homeopathic spray, you can get a silica influence, which is upright leafy growth, or you can get a calcium uh, influence, which is broad round leaves. So that's the same plant sprayed with different homeopathic substances to influence its growth habit, which is, which is exactly what Steiner was talking about, the silica and calcium uh, polarity. And then in this instance, this is a kale plant, and he sprayed it with several different formulations that was able to keep it either leafy or to induce flowering. So uh, that research was very interesting. And then finally, we, we had this in the first lecture, but there's a number of different resources that you can tap into to look into this further. Uh, books by Paramagnetism and Phil Callahan, the, work, the books on the, uh, biomagnetism and cell energy. And then the SVP wiki is really a great source. It gets into John Keeley and Walter Russell and Nikola Tesla. So just a few slides there, a quick introduction. Uh, this topic could go on and on. And uh, so this is just a, a snapshot. Great. Okay, you see it? Yes, you see you. Yeah. Good, good, good. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Steve just mentioned certain people. Uh, for instance, one of them was uh, Professor Pop in Germany, and he worked with biophotons. We took over that laboratory 12 years ago, and our team was uh, very much focused upon agriculture and what it does. What we found after several years of research in the field of biology is, and in agriculture is that one of the most interesting elements for us to do some research in was water. And during this presentation, I will give you many examples and also the tests that we did into uh, in either the open field and into green, greenhouses. Uh, especially because there is a huge connection between light and water. And I will come back to that. Light is, as we know, is a source of information, and it is based upon electromagnetic waves. And all our life is based upon electromagnetic waves. But water can receive those electromagnetic waves and can do something with it into biological systems. And there is only one huge problem in the world, and especially in agriculture, we create this problem because most waters in the world are absolutely not in balance. We did research all over the world from Greenland to the Himalayas, to the US, uh, or many places, but it is not in balance. And it has huge consequences in the world of agriculture. What are we talking about? We are talking about light. I give you, for instance, here, you see, 
in this range here. These are tones, tones known in the world of physics. This is normal, the world of physics. These are the X-rays and these are the UV waves. And this is infrared. All of this is light. We only see seven colors, only one octave. And each octave has a large number of waveforms. This is the fundamental wave, as you can see here. And there you have tones and overtones. And you think, why is that important? Well, light works with these waves constantly. And if these waves are not in balance, then certain parts in the molecular structure or in the atomic structure are related to the damage that is created. And you'll find it back into your harvest. Here you see that you see only a very limited area and we focus in most of our research in the world, we focus only upon the chemical world. And of course, Steve already mentioned there is a mineral world, there's a biological world, but yes, there is a world of energy and probably that is the world that we really, really understand. But that is one of the most interesting parts of it because Without sun, there is no harvest. Every farmer know that, knows that. What do we do? What did we do? We look to all the waveforms in the ultraviolet from the X-rays from the ultraviolet to the visual light to the near infrared. And as you can see here, each part of that specific wavelength works on a different level. One of the molecules and the other one on the atomic structure and in the chemical structure and also how the chemical structures work together. Let me first give you an example of biophotons because everybody talks about biophotons, but what is a biophoton? This is an, an example for you. These are wet seeds. And that's, that is just photography, very simple. And the real story starts when you give the seed water then something is going to trigger it. And immediately under the, into the soil, one feet under the soil, you see this, light is coming up. And this is very strange because this is not the light only of the seeds, but when you really follow it for multiple minutes, you see that there is a dance with light going on. And these seeds, they respond to the environment. Is the soil healthy? Does it have minerals? Does it have certain substances? It communicates. It is as if it looks around and see, am I safe? That sounds very strange for you, but it, we did so many research on it and you can see that each seed really responds to the environment. And it starts when you give it water. These are biophotons, by the way. This is what you see in the world of the biophotons. And this is the growth phase of seeds. First, you see an explosion of light. That's this first phase. And then you go. You I'm just going to interrupt for one second, Dolph. Um, are these supposed to be animated? This is, this is a reality. This is, uh, this is uh, coming from the research. Right. I, I'm getting a couple of questions about whether we should see something moving. These, we're, we're experiencing static pictures here on the screen, not an animation. There was just a question about whether that's, whether you have animations or not. I have only, uh, I have only these uh, sheets, uh, Dan. At the, end, I show, uh, at the end, I show you real pictures of real life in, in field uh, situation. No, no. Okay. Yeah, it was just a question I, in the chat. Okay, sorry to interrupt. You see here the growing phase, and at the growing phase, you can see exactly the waveforms. At the very beginning, I told you that we are looking to waveforms. And what we found out is, for instance, that this is a fresh leaf full of light, and this when it is dying. And what we see nowadays is that if you have this type of energy, this type of biophotons into the field, so this type of energy, then you see that the crops will not evolve. And we also found out what is going to happen when people are going to eat this type of food, 
when you have this level of energy. And you can see that back alter also into the health of the human beings that eat this type of food. So what we are looking for is extremely healthy food with a lot of biophotons. And how did we do that? We did it with water. We looked to water. And this is all research that we did in Japan and in London together. And this is a part of the, uh, this is a uh, game in nature, science report. And these are all the waveforms in water. Does water respond in the right way to light and to the sun? And where is it based upon? This is based upon the fact that water is making a dance in its atomic structure. Here you can see that all the atoms are working together. But you can create all kinds of forms over here. For instance, this is chaotic. Then the atoms don't work together. But if they are going to work together, like for instance, what you see here, then it works almost like a Roman legion. You almost get the full energy into the water. And where is that full energy coming from? That is coming from the cosmos, from the sun, the moon, and the complete electromagnetic field that surrounds us on this planet. So if you want to have a healthy soil and a healthy plant, you really need that electromagnetic field that is there from Mother Nature. In the previous presentation, you saw already that there were certain antennas, but it has to do with the water that collects it. And if this is the structure of water, then you have the ability to collect that light and transport it in the right order to the plants. If you have this situation, then you have a serious problem. And what we found out is that especially in the world whereby we use a lot of toxins in the aquaculture, when you have rainwater dropping onto the soil, then most of the time the soil is going to respond with the water in this level. So farming is becoming extremely critical because if you put in the right water onto your soil, then it has the ability to collect that electromagnetic field in such a way that all those waveforms, as I just showed you, are there in the right order. Here, and that is the calculation made by quantum physicists, because now we are talking in energy, we are talking about a complete new world. We are talking about the world of quantum biology. That is a complete new form of biology but that is where we talk about. It has to do with quantum fields and organization of atomic structures. And water is the key role in that. Here, for instance, if you have a structure into your atoms, into the water, then you have much more energy, and then you have much more chemical response later on into your food. Here you see all those waveforms, and this is in nanometers, and you can find it in the infrared. And here you can see how water is creating a dance in its atomic structure with all these waveforms. And why is that important? If you don't understand water, then certain elements into the soil simply do not respond because you don't get the right wave. And then you have to bring in more stuff yourself. You have to bring in certain minerals yourself or all kinds of other materials that are not required if you only simply bring in the right water. And I'll bring you, because we did 40 years research in this area, and we measured thousands of systems all over the world with all kinds of crops especially in Europe, but also in the USA. And we did it on inside and outside fields. And what you see here is, for instance, tomatoes. And what we found out, these tomatoes suddenly got a very serious problem with the fungi. And we changed the water. And one week later, the fungi was gone. 
in those parts whereby we use specific water that has a certain balance. And as I told you, most water at this moment of time is not in balance in the world. Here I give you another example, and that was really a very strange situation. As you know, even in the world of biodynamics, we hardly have a male and female cucumber situation anymore. It doesn't exist. And after giving the cucumbers, as you see here, for three years, that specific water, we noticed that the seeds were changing in the DNA structure year after year. Uh, we hardly needed any additional minerals or whatever, became stronger. And after three, four years, suddenly we had a male female situation in our plants. And that was something that never happened before in Europe for 60 years. And it was only done due to water. And suddenly the electromagnetic waves can come in in the right order. And then what we see is that in the seeds, when you collect the seeds from these cucumbers, they change year after years. And we did the same with tomatoes. We did the same with other vegetables. And it has everything, every year, what we saw is that the seeds that we collected out of vegetables that had a certain stability into the water, what we call coherent water, then every year those seeds increased in power. You don't have to do anything of it. On top of that, we did something else as well. We also used our water on polluted soil. And a lot of the soil in the world is completely damaged due to the toxins we've used. And what we did, we only put water in a stable form, what we call a coherent form. And it took us years to make that water and find out how can you create stable water in such a way that it really sp spontaneously responds to all those normal electromagnetic fields. After three, four months, we noticed that the soil was changing dramatically and it took out many of the toxins. Normally these are four pages of toxins. I only show you one page or the second page here as well. It was some of those things, aluminia, iron, all of them were too high. They were not in balance anymore. And what we noticed is that the bacteria, the fungi in the soil changed completely by modern nature. And they took out all those harmful minerals and other organic materials that create a non-balance into the soil. And we have seen it now on multiple places. So water was really one of the critical areas. Here you can see, and we compare, for instance, two types of tomatoes, one with untreated water that was rainwater. And we took the same rainwater and we treated that with the device so that it became more stable. And here you see the wavelength of the tomato. And what we notice is that you see calcium, you see the potassium, you see the kalium, or all, all iron, it's all there. But there is one huge difference. The structure, the structure and the light, the biophotons increase dramatically. So if you have the right structure, then suddenly something else is going to happen. You see the communication between the plant and the soil. There is, some, there is an ongoing communication in the electromagnetic field between those areas. And we took hundreds of carrots, thousands of carrots, years after years, and we compared them. And what we saw here is that in the UV, in the near infrared, and in the Raman, in the atomic structure. So in all those light forms, not only in the physical light, but all the other light forms, we noticed that the structure of the atoms and the structure of the molecules was not only better, but the taste was also better. And the whole soil hardly need any additional minerals. That was a huge, huge difference compared with other. So we went to an organic field. 
And some of those farmers worked for more than 20 years in the organic field. And they found out that there was still something missing, but they didn't know how. They gave, they gave minerals, normal minerals, all in organic treatment. And then we started to give it water. And in one year time, in one year time, you see already the difference. That was the treatment with water. There was an explosion of energy, five times more energy in the carrot. And it became much more tasteful as well. And why was that? Because the water can collect, as what I told you, that Roman legion, it can collect that information, that electromagnetic field from the sun and the moon and all the other planets. As was just described by Steve in the previous presentation, that you had a certain conjunction between Saturn and the sun. All those things, all those things constantly work together. And that is what we found out here as well. And that is what gave us a huge energy. Then we did another test with mitochondria. And the mitochondria are the building blocks because they create ATP and ATP is the energy. And what we saw is that only by giving water, the tomatoes, and it was a huge tomato field in a greenhouse of two football fields. And in all those tomatoes, the microbiome increased dramatically, sometimes with an effect of five to 10. That means that the ATP is increasing. And as you know, ATP stands for energy. Without ATP, no life possible. And you cannot swallow ATP, it must grow itself. So we saw that there was a difference in the soil. We saw that there was a difference in the microbiome and there was a difference in light form and it was an improvement in the taste. Inferences, we compared it also with some farmers that gave additional minerals or other things to increase the power of the microbiome. But it was the water that created the difference. And here you see, it gives much more energy, but also what we found out that the plant was much more resistant against any disease. So you don't need additional thing like in the biodynamics, sometimes they use copper, nothing like that. Nothing was necessary. And the soil became fantastic. We tested the soil afterwards also on chemical base. There was really an improvement. And here you see the, the reason why ATP and the mitochondria are so important. Why is that so important? Because there is now a very clear relationship between the mitochondria into the soil and into the gut of the human being. Only if we eat real vegetables, the, the mitochondria of those vegetables come into your gut and that create a very good bacterial life into your gut. And that makes 70% of your own resistance. So the food is really becoming a medicine again. And the only thing we did is increase the level and the quality of the water. And here you see that year after year, it improved. All the things that I, by the way, just showed you, all those outcomes were done by external universities. We only improved it and after our own tests, we gave it to external universities, these tomatoes and these carrots and other vegetables, and they did all the measurements. And what we saw is that year after year, the soil became better. And not only that, the seeds produced more, and with the latest test that we have seen, for instance, with cucumbers, we noticed that normally a cucumber takes around 14, 15 weeks from beginning to end. And most farmers now have cucumbers still available after week 24. That is really amazing. So the harvest increased dramatically. Not the plant increased, not, not the size, but the light into the plant increased and the quality increase, and also the taste. And this is more or less what you can see if you eat a tomato 
whereby you work with toxins. And this is the quality of the light when you work with water that has certain coherence. And all those things play a major role in our life. So my talk to you is about what is the outside energy? What is it doing? Well, it needs a medium to play its role. And that medium is water. But water at this moment of time, due to all the toxins we've used also in agriculture and the toxins that we have put into the air are damaging those structures in the molecules of water and it becomes chaotic. And then it cannot do its work. So that is the reason that we emphasized and we did multiple tests all over the world with water and see how we can improve that. Now, the latest test that we are doing is also how can we bring back the CO2 damage in the world? Because everybody is talking about how do we limit down the CO2 into the air? The problem is how do we bring back the CO2 into the soil where it belongs? And we are now doing tests because what we have seen is when, when the mitochondria are increasing and the soil is becoming better, then it has the ability to absorb much more of the CO2. So it has much more to do with it only bringing better seeds, better soil. It is a complete circle that we try to create. And for that reason, the energy and the quality of energy and the quality of the elements that work with these energy are played a critical role. That is what I wanted to share with you. All right. Well, um, we've got 40 minutes left and we have Dolph and Steve here to uh, <laughs> try to unpack all this stuff. I'm, um, I think I've had extended conversations with both of you and feel like I've been able to ask the questions that make it more um, understandable to me. Uh, Dolph, there's, there's one question here from um, um, Roger. Uh, how do you prepare the water that gives this response? Um, That's not... a very good question. Because yeah. a lot of farmers nowadays use kind of vortexing uh, technologies or they use minerals or magnets. The water always responds to all of those. But what we did is that we found out how does water respond in a broad spectrum of the electromagnetic wave. And for us, it was difficult to find out. And we had to go back to modern nature. And it took us more than a year to make water that has the ability to copy itself. So you had to follow certain rules of modern nature. You have to go through the complete cycle, winter, summer, spring, autumn, to collect that water bring it back in its energy form and its atomic structure, hold it there, and water has the ability to copy itself. So you can make that water, not with a simple device, it takes a lot of work, but you can use that water and then you can bring that water into a device and that can create water for the agriculture. I think, with <laughs> the specifics was, I think probably what the question was about, are there, are there, are there certain principles that are that are being used? Is this a proprietary technology? Um, yeah, in, I mean, the the, yeah, the it, it, oh, oh. <laughs> it is not a single device where you can work it in. You have to find out certain rules in nature, especially how can you open and structure the atomic structures of water. That is done by a device, but you can only do that to keep that structure if you, for instance, work in summertime or in springtime, because then the structure of the water is different. As you can imagine, when it is winter, the density of the atoms are much closer. And all those things have an effect in a kind of memory of water. Water has a certain memory and it collects those forms and it all works together. So we had to find out when is there a certain atomic structure and it is very technical. So I cannot say, oh, that is that easy. You take a machine and that is that, that's not that. It is far too technical for that. We work with a team with almost 10 to 15 physicists and biologists to find out all those rules, how water works. And it took us really millions of dollars to find out. And that is all the research that we did over those years. So for part, it is 
uh, something that can be done with a machine, but certain parts were only the rules of nature that made us possible for us to, to make this water. Is there, do you have a, a website or? Yeah, um, yeah. If you go to uh, where that people you, can view yeah, yeah, you, dive deep into it. Yeah, if you go to water and light, EU, then I can, then we show you certain movies and on other websites, because that is very interesting that is taking place now, uh, has been uh, multiple tests have been taking place in London as well. If you go to Analemma Water, then you see the other outcome of the research. So Water and Light is one of website and the other one is Analemma. And uh, in, on both websites, you can find some of the research findings and how it is made. All right, beautiful. I mean, I, I would love to see, you said you've done all these studies with cucumbers and carrots and things like that. Um, if you have those, those studies are cited on that. Oh yeah, we, we work with more than uh, 30, 40 types of vegetables. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, um, Margaret asks, uh, can you explain the very last slide? It is not clear. Okay, the very last slide shows you the biophotons. And this is a very interesting slide. You see the light coming up, if it is working with a certain type of water, as we just described. And the other light form, the low red one, is the energy level of a tomato plant in its biophotons. So when you go to the supermarket, you see maybe fantastic red tomato, but it has no real biophotons in it. It has no real life. That's very important because what we found out, and that is part of our research, is that if you are going to eat that specific tomato, then it has an impact on your health because those those biophotons are entering your body and they play a role with your mitochondria and everything. So this is a very important outcome that we found out. Those herbicides are very harmful. And I would not be surprised if a lot of the problems that we found out in the world of health has to do with the way we grow our food at the moment. And the energy that it is in it, not just the elements and quote unquote nutrients, as you said, yeah. right? It's not just about the copper or the zinc or the polyphenols or the antioxidants. It's yeah. about the vibrational coherence um, as, and one mode of assessment is the biophotonics. Absolutely. And that is exactly also what Steve found out is that you have not only the minerals, but in this case, it is the, the, the way it creates all those elements and the formation and that has an impact upon any biological system at all. Also, in the seed, what you see is that if you have a seed, you give it this water, in one way or another, it is going to change the DNA. It is as if it gets more resistant to all kinds of diseases. That is what we found out. <laughs> I hope I hope people are 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 um, you know open to these to these thoughts. I've always found this conversation <clears throat> extremely intriguing, and I, I I believe it can be tracked out through science through the process of science. Um, and you know, having heard about uh, Fritz Albert Pop and the work of biophotonics, and then hearing that you have uh, been taken over his lab after his passing, I'm really honored to have you speaking to us. Um, Steve, do you have any any comments or, or questions for Dolph about what he's been presenting or ways maybe to translate it? Uh, other ways well, to one, present people? One, so it may one, be big, com one big comment is that I really appreciate seeing Dolph's work because I've, I've seen a little bit about Dolph, but I didn't understand all, all the details that he's, he's been doing. And, um, but it, the, the, the match up very well with what I was saying also is that it is the vitality and the underlying energy and people, people have different ways of explain, explaining this, but it's an important component of, of biological health. And of course that means, as we talked about before, that starts at the cellular level. Yeah. So all living systems are, are based on cells and subatomic 
I mean, subcellular activities, the mitochondria and the ATP that Dolph was talking about. So, but it's the underlying energy that people have different ways of describing vitality and, and coherence, and biofield, uh, wow. all the way to etheric. Um, and the other thing is that it's not, it's not easily defined. It's like it's about a bunch of blindfolded people describing an elephant from different sides of the elephant, right? And they're so quite certain that this feels like a trunk or they're quite certain that this is like a big foot uh, and they're very good at it. But yeah, we're, we're, we're really on the verge of discovery of so many things. The water conferences um, uh, and uh, you know, the work that Dolph's describing is really just so, such a smashing, par uh, a paradigm smashing view when he's you know referring to electromagnetic um, influence on water and then even in the seasons you know that that kind of comes back to how they make the biodynamic preparations some are made in the you know fall to spring some are spring to fall you know etc etc so i like it i feel like we don't even really have the language to discuss what's going on here um, but it's, I, I, I've always found the questions and the conversation very stimulating. I'll, I'll just I'll bring up a couple more questions that have come in from the, from the audience. Um, there's not a lot coming in today. So people who are listening and they want to pipe in, please feel free. Um, Valerie asks, what do you recommend for small backyard gardeners to improve the vitality of their vegetables using water and energy? What we try to do, and I don't want to be a kind of salesperson now, but we want to bring this water to the world, especially in the world of agriculture. And the reason is that uh, we think that uh, we have to speed up uh, the change in this world in the way how we handle agriculture. So uh, what we simply do is that uh, we have now certain machines. I can show you the files maybe. We have devices like this in agriculture. So you connect it to the water system and this is the outcome. And then the water is copied in such a way that it becomes uh, coherent again. We don't do the test ourselves. We let those tests do by universities. So after many years of work, we have the ability to come up with these devices. And then we want to make them as cheap as possible so that we can speed up this uh, way of working in the world of agriculture. And then we really think that we get a lot of feedback. As a matter of fact, we're going to do a huge number of testing with the State University in California with, uh, with this device. Chico State. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful. And what is the price if you say there as little as possible for different scales? Well, it uh, depends how big the agriculture field is, but uh, let's say this is uh, for a small garden, this might be a little bit too expensive, then we have smaller ones. But for an average, uh, for an average system like this, it's costing you around two or three thousand US dollars. And you can work for 10 years with it. Beautiful. Um, okay, um, Margaret Ru has seems to have a number of questions here. Um, have you measured GMO seeds? Um, oh. Uh, can you explain how structured water voids out pesticides? Yeah, I can. Uh, there's two questions, by the way. Uh, what is happening if pesticides play a major role? They have killed a lot of the bacteria into the field, as we all know. Of. Uh, what we do see is that due to the right water, suddenly the electromagnetic field from and around the world is able to bring back a certain life form into the both in those bacteria. It is as if those electromagnetic fields together with water can create life. There is a certain intelligence. Don't ask me how and what. We only found out that yes, it has this ability in it. And we improved that by using certain types of homeopathy of those bacteria that were there in the past. If you increase that and you do that together, and it is really an explosion. And uh, that is also a test that we have done with the university. So the only what we, we, what we have done, for instance, in certain areas is that we use the past 
a, a small part of the bacteria that were there in the past, and we brought it back with this coherent water. And then we see that in a very short time frame, those bacteria are coming back. So that can help a lot of farmers that want to move from the traditional way of farming to the more organic way of farming. Because the, the, then the soil is really playing a major role. And have you measured uh, GMO seeds? And do you have any? Yes, we have. On what you've. Yeah. And what we see is that they have a limited amount of frequencies in the light form. So that was really a shock. What we saw is that those GMO seeds, they have been manipulated. And they cannot give you the full microbiome into the vegetables that you need as a human being. So what we see is that it limits down the quality of life in total. As a matter of fact, we are doing now some very serious tests as we speak with, uh, with uh, this type of uh, seeds and with this, uh, with this type of agriculture. And we are looking now also, does it have, gives an effect on DNA? So uh, we are looking to do it in depth, yes. So we have done that test, yes. Beautiful. Um, Reginald asks, have any comparisons been done with hydroponically grown food? I'm not sure comparisons with what uh, specifically, but um, no. <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 I would presume if you're talking about hydroponics and you're talking about structured water and yeah. you're talking about the coherence of the water being you know, of critical import in the vitality of the plant, then this would be a way to do hydroponics much more well. Um, yeah, but be aware then uh, there, there's a lot of discussion now going on and everybody is it's going to be a hype. Everybody talks about coherent water or something else. And not all the waters that are called coherent are really able to bring back the full spectrum of light. For us, that light was very critical because the cosmos bringing not only one octave, but multiple light octaves and all play a role in the bacteria, the fungi, all that stuff. So... That is why we, we really found out due to the waveforms that not all those structured waters are really structured waters. As a matter of fact, yes, they are structured, but very often only in a limited area. Well, that's, I mean, this is one of the biggest problems with this whole space is that people make claims and you know, they're charismatic and they've got a, a nice shiny you know, a packaging and yeah. the person who's being sold the product has no way of testing or verifying the, the the validity or the value of that material so or that product this is part of why i've shied away from saying too much about things in this space is because i personally don't know enough to feel like i can speak with confidence about what actually is happening but on principle if you were to use a water that you know did have many octaves of coherence um would you would you agree that that in a hydroponic environment um a much more nutritious crop food could be grown. Absolutely. I mean, arguments about why hydroponic is not good. It's there's no soil, there's no sunlight, it's in plastic, you know, it, they're yeah. well, it has an effect, but I always prefer to work in soil for, and for a very simple reason, it has to do with the mitochondria. Mm. Because what we are, what we do see now is that into the soil, you have so many bacteria bacterial life forms and they are needed and in one way or another they are coming back into the vegetable itself and then you eat it so there is a real cycle from the soil to the animal and to the human and that is a, that is a normal cycle and in that way we have mother nature working in the other way we create something artificial yeah thank you for that answer <laughs> oh, um, uh, Bill asks, is there a device I can use on rainwater I collect in barrels? Is untreated rainwater any better than untreated well water? Which water is easier to treat? Uh, well, sometimes we have seen that there are even different types of rainwater. Sometimes it's so polluted depending the way you live. So sometimes we put a, a kind of filter in front of it so that it takes out most of the uh, negative elements and then we 
put it through the device. But we have even used this divide, device in polluted water. And then we still see an effect that when there is again a certain coherence in the water, then again, you see Mother Nature working with the electromagnetic fields as Steve discussed. And those electromagnetic forms immediately create an improvement in the water quality. So yes, there is a real, real electromagnetic field that has a certain intelligence in it and that can work together with water. So that is why we have used also this divide with polluted soil or uh, polluted water as well. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Margaret and Bill have a similar question here. Margaret asks, how long does the NLM01 stay structured? One year, five years? And Bill says, how do you keep water coherent over time? How long after treatment can it be used on plants? What is it that you do? And then, yeah, what is it that? <laughs> well, we, we, we have never, I cannot say that we have done more than 10 to 20 years of testing. That is not true. But all the, every test that I just showed you, and there are multiple more tests that we have done, you can see it on the website, is done with water that has been several months old already after the treatment. And the reason that we did it and why we also asked university to do the testing is that most of those water or people that claim that the water becomes more coherent, when you put it under certain pressure, and that is what we did in, in, in our laboratory, when you put it under pressure, then immediately it collapses. And most of the uh, electrons into the water when it has a certain co coherency is losing its coherency within a day, a maximum a week. That is why all our tests were done with water that was several weeks or months old. And, yeah, and, and then what the question was, will it stay? It, it, it remains there for years. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and then, so you've got, a, I mean, your, your, your process is you're passing it through a, a structuring device, whatever that is. And, yeah. you know, effectively in, in the irrigation, if you're gonna be putting out 20,000 gallons of irrigation water onto a field, um, it passes through there and it's all done and that's it. Uh, yeah. we, we have also systems very big, very big for, for really big fields. So it depends of course on the size of the field and the pressure, but yes, it works. <laughs> I'd love to be able to bring this information more broadly forward um, and have you know, peer reviewed papers and things, not just your, your, your charisma and confidence, but uh, one thing at a time, it's great to have you on. Uh, Lenore asks, how can we practically restore balance to water and soil at large scale that we need to heal the damage humans have done? Is anyone from your research team speaking to the leaders preparing for the UN Food Summit? My, uh, my jaw is dropped, but makes sense to me. And it also lends more explanation to my work with people in chronic pain and trauma helped by regulating nervous system through myofascial electromagnetic body work and somatic psychotherapy based on neuroscience. So, um, you know, how can we do this in large scale? Uh, UN, UN Food Summit, any communications? Well, what we are doing then, because this is a very important question, for that reason, we are now talking on many world congresses. And that is also why we want to do some tests uh, with uh, some very important universities also in the USA. And we want the local professors to publish around uh, on, on this topic. So uh, we support them with our team. And we want as soon as possible that politicians and other members that have certain influence in the world are aware of this situation. And that is why we want to do all those tests with uh, people from all over the world. As a matter of fact, we spoke also with the minister in India. And uh, also there we are doing some uh, very important tests. So, uh, but for us, America is, is a very important country uh, because a lot of the farmers uh, cannot move now to a more dynamic, biodynamic way of farming. And that is really a pity. We would like to see that they can really make that step and that they see the difference because it has of course also an impact upon the, on the money they have to make. So that is why we really push it in the US. Yeah, beautiful. Well, we're happy to have it pushed here. <laughs> I think I'd be happy if the food on the shelves had more, uh, <laughs> more bio photons in it. Absolutely. 
Um, Rob, Rob asks if Steve can talk more on ESP of plants. Yeah, I can. Let's see. I can. I was, we were talking about the structure of water and research. So yeah, there was some recent research um, that, that has been done on structured water in, in horticulture and agriculture. So uh, that was one of the Italian devices. And so yeah, there's, there is some more research coming out uh, that people can tap into. Uh, so on ESP of plants, what, what that was, um, was, like I said, it was Cleve Baxter in his work with um, basically lie detector devices or galvanic response devices. And, and then that was really, you know, you think about alternative sciences are quickly poo-pooed by academia. And, and that was, even today, people really criticize people being able to, plants being able to, to, to detect people talking to them, playing music to them, you know, sending energy and love to, to plants. And, you know, the common response is, oh, no, there's nothing to that. But, but no, in fact, there, it is. And, and there was a really great chapter in, in a biophysics books by some Russian scientists who, who did the same thing, and they, they, they verified and found the same thing. So, and then there's other groups that have, that do remote healing and, um, and other kinds of energy work. And they've done cell cultures in petri dishes. They've done plant studies. They've done this where people are in different parts of the building in different states on one continent and another continent. And that this is what is known as quantum non-locality. And it also implies that, th that these energy fields uh, or you know, whatever is tra traveling through the through the space is traveling faster than the speed of light. So all of that's connected. Uh, and yeah, that there's people can tap into that and, and read about it some more. Uh, so yeah, remote healing, distance healing is really a thing. And the way plants are in biological systems in general, we're related to each other, we're interconnected. Uh, there's a lot to all of this. So I think one key thing is that what I really like about Dalt's presentation is, is that underlying uh, a very good approach to managing soil health for organic matter and humus and for cover crops and the roots and the living soil biology and the microbiome and also integrating a balanced suite of minerals. All that is very important and fundamental to agriculture and most farmers can relate to that. And I will say in most instances, that is totally the fundamental thing that farmers need to do. You need to be able to grow a plant and get it transplanted on time. Uh, so, but underlying all that are these energy fields. And so that's why remote healing and, and, and all these other things are part of this big uh, toolbox. You know, this not exactly agriculture, it's the crossover between human health and, and agriculture. Great. Um, Dolph, do you have any, any comments you want to make on that topic? Oh, can... I fully agree with, uh, with Steve on this. Maybe uh, let me explain a little bit more about how this might work. We don't know yet, but we sometimes forget that we are for 99% water molecules. Everybody talks about we have 70% water, but it's not true. 70% is the weight of water in your body. But in reality, of all the molecules in your body, 99%, and all those water molecules are also around us on this planet due to the oceans and the clouds and everything. So this, this, all those things work together, even on a distance. And that is exactly what Steve just described. It all works together and it works with, with, with something that goes much faster than the speed of light and also with a certain intelligence behind it. And that makes, for instance, quantum biology very interesting for the future. I always like to talk about how we're 98% something other than the physical plane, too, right? I mean, or 90 or 96%. <laughs> but most of reality is on a on a on a on an octave that we can't find, right? Dark matter and dark energy. That's it. There's something going on out there, which is most of everything that is, 
that we can see with the fact that we can, you know, see that it's not something we can see. Um, you know, it's 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 a real interesting dynamic where we have this <clears throat> identification with a physical body, with a the physical plane, and what we can't see it, touch it, sm smell it, you know, feel it, it doesn't exist. And yet everything we know from the scientists is that this is really just a very, very small part of of all that is. And so, um, you know, just because we haven't been taught about it in schools or we don't have the direct physical perception doesn't mean that there's not a lot more going on out there. And I, I, it's really wonderful to be able to, at least at least a little bit in this, in this conference, <laughs> have this conversation um, and um, hopefully not be um, left off the stage. I guess you can't be left off the stage and everybody's <laughs> not able to, not able to um, <clears throat> communicate uh, directly, but I, we have a few more questions here. So I'll just, I'll just keep going with them. Um, Emmanuel asks, I, I'm presuming about your systems, Dolph, are they available for purchase? And yep. I think I heard you say on um, water and light. Oh, no, uh, then you have to go to Analema dash water. Analema is the sales organization. I, we do the research, but Analema water, that's the, uh, Organization that is selling products. And what's was there a website that's associated? Yeah, there's a website. If you go to Analema, Analema is the circle of the sun during the year with water. And then there is a website. And if you go to that website and you can send them an email, then they come up to you. A N N A L E M M A. Yeah, Analema. Yeah. Okay. I'll let people figure it out from there. It's not. Okay. It's not, not being a salesman. You have to figure it out. This is. Great. Uh, I, know, I, appreciate I don't want to be in a sales now. <laughs> We've got something really amazing, but we're going to make it hard for you to get one. Perfect. <laughs> no, you, you, you can find it on the website. Yeah. Um, Severio says remote healing sounds like prayer. Okay, so let me throw something else out there. In, in a way, it is. Um, and it is, yeah. the, um, so we have this, this balance between practitioner knowledge and innovations and also scientific knowledge and, and innovation. So I tend to draw back on, on the science side because that has a real basis in, in technical merit. And it's also something that is published that people can refer back to. So but there's, I think it'd be helpful in response to that is to mention two things. One is the research, the intention experiments that was done by William Teller at Stanford University. Uh, uh, physicist, very thoroughly done that showed intention, which is like prayer and mental thought forms does influence biological systems. And then also the pair experiments at Princeton University, very similar is that human consciousness influences biological systems and matter. So two really solid sources that people can refer to. Um, and yeah. It would be great to get these citations if you've got them, Steve. I mean, because you can spit them out verbally, but people who might want to be able to use them in a conversation with someone else, how do they find them? Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a list of these kinds of things somewhere? I think. Yeah, well, it's a big, long list and it's deep. <laughs> <laughs> I think if we're going to be trying to have this conversation seriously and not and not be, you know, um, woo woo or or right. whatever. And well, just just remember <laughs> that uh, in my in my first lecture, I yeah. did talk about the water conference, and I'm sure Dolph is very familiar with the with the water conference. But some really top notch scientists who who work in this field and um, uh, Gerald Paul, Gerald Pollack. A lot of people have heard of Gerald Pollack in the in, in the fourth phase of water or Igor German, uh, the, there's various other people who have all contributed to this, but some of the things that Dolph is talking about are just so different from the way we have been schooled in basically chemistry and biology. It really is the cutting edge. And so the nice thing is that there's a worldwide uh, symposium, uh, international symposium of all the top scientists who are working in water. So people can see their presentations, they can read their papers, they can make these connections. Uh, so if Dolph is talking about electromagnetic frequencies on water, structured water, 
there is a plethora of information out there that people can tap into and put together two and two and, and make sense of all this. So really we're, 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 on, the, we're on the verge of some real great uh, new understandings in, in biology because of all this work in the field of, of energetics and in the field of coherent water. Uh, Valerie just asks, what's the name of the Princeton study on impact of consciousness? Oh, there, was a, there was a whole, it was the P-E-A-R, PEAR, all capitals. And um, it was so thoroughly proven that they actually closed down the research. They did it for years and years. They published dozens of papers out of it. You can go online and tap into that research. I think, yeah. And, I, you know, but just so, you know, People, you know, let's just let's just cut to the chase and talk about the reality is that people have prayed over meals for millennia, right? Well, when you say a prayer, you can you can influence the food and you can influence the water. Or you say a prayer over your over your garden. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's the whole right. point is that your intention with that, with that coherent, as it were, intention, you affect the world around you, um, which is what a lot of the spiritual traditions have been teaching. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, so I was, I was, uh, I was working at the uh, at the National Center for Appropriate of Information, Sustainable Ag Information with Datra, and we took calls from farmers and extension agents in all fifty states, and so there we we get a phone call. And someone comes over and says, hey, Steve, someone says they're praying for seeds. Do you want to take the call? And sure enough, I got on the phone with this guy. Turns out the guy was so fascinating. He's written several books. And what he did was he had studied Reiki. And he studied uh, different indigenous cultures from Hawaii and, and the, the, you know, the Native Americans in the Southwest. And so he started making... Reiki enhanced basically prayer treatments for seeds and then growing out corn and so forth. And he was getting multiple ears of corn per plant. He was getting a higher yield of corn, you know, per plant, et cetera. And so, you know, you can, you can backtrack and read about how different people have done different things. Yeah. A lot of these traditional indigenous practices actually maybe operating from this deep <laughs> That's yeah deep profound level of understanding got you know lo, lo, lo and behold um martha asks can someone spell out p-e-a-r is it stand for something is it an acronym yes but it's it, um, i can't um i can't um yeah i can't tell you for sure but it'd be simple if you just looked up the pair experiments at princeton and human consciousness yeah. Probably, can, probably can Google it there if it hasn't been removed. Great. Um, we got a couple more big questions here. We've got three minutes left. Um, I'm not sure if you guys would like to just sort of um, offer any any broad comments or thoughts you'd like to share, or or just do questions until the end. Well, I think that also the previous discussion upon Steve and prayers, it means that uh, our consciousness really works on this level. As a matter of fact, uh, what we did, for instance, in it, we have done some tests in India whereby certain Brahmins were working on seeds by prayers. And we saw an improvement of the biophotons year after year. So it has everything to do with our conscious level. So it's very interesting that we move also in that direction as what uh, Steve just described. And I think that is part of a complete holistic view upon how we should work together with nature, because I think we have forgotten that. Yeah. Beautiful. Steve, any any final final words or or, uh, or thoughts? Well, the, in context of eco-agriculture, we, we talked about, this was a series that we talked about, the three pillars being the minerals, biology, and energy. And energy, I would say, is the lesser known of the three, and it's also the more experimental part of the three. But um, really, if you don't have energy coursing through your cells, you're, you're not going to, you're going to fall over. Uh, energy just is part of life. So it is, it's newer to our way of thinking 
and uh, it's a whole new way of, of thinking and exploring, but I think it has an opportunity for us to improve our biological health and our agricultural production. And, you know, I'm just, so anyways, I, I appreciate what Dolph presented. It's, that was pretty in-depth uh, understanding of the importance of coherent water. So that'd be one of the many different tools in a toolbox that eco ag farmers and regenerative ag, ag farmers can can look into. Yeah, and I would say that you know, I mean, just you you framed it as this is all a very new thing for us, and perhaps it's only new for those of us operating from the Western rational concept, and it's it's not at all new for those who have a more direct connection with nature. I think if it's coming down to praying over water and praying over seeds and talking to your plants, I mean, that's a lot of what the indigenous cultures say is the foundational way to engage, speaking to the plants, speaking to nature, listening, you know, engaging with your consciousness. Um, I mean, it seems like those are the central, the central tenets of that indigenous worldview. And to be able to sort of connect that to the, the, the science, the biophysics, et cetera. Um, and to be able to say, here's the indigenous perspective and what they say, here's the, here's the cutting edge Western science. And lo and behold, they overlap beautifully. Um, I mean, that to me is very exciting to be able to be, you know, having that conversation and perhaps connecting those wires um, in, our, in our understandings, so. Um, our time is our time is out uh, for this presentation. I hope people have enjoyed it, and um, I personally would love to have more of this in our conference. Um, so uh, I yeah, thank you both very much for for your time and your wisdom and knowledge. And um, yeah, Dolph, I'm really excited to see what happens with this instrument you've been developing. It, I mean, it really sounds quite profound. Um, and all best wishes with it all, so. Don, Steve, thank you for this and I uh, look forward to speak with you next time. Beautiful, okay. Okay, Thank Bye. you all. Yeah. Thank you.